So um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tiana Jackson. I'm a talent and literary agent. Uh, my agency is headquartered in Century City, California. I'm excited to be here today to present to you guys pilot season prep, which is just a little snippet of what exactly pilot season is, and then a Q&A so that we can answer any questions that you guys have. If you do have a question, you should see a box down below in Zoom and it says Q&A. Click on there and you can type in your questions. And once I'm done with my presentation, we'll open up the Q&A and I'll start answering your questions. So once again, I'm Tiana Jackson, I'm an agent for the Jackson Agency. I wanted to thank the HALP Network as well as the Black Agents Network for coming together to sponsor a series of webinars that we'll be doing. Today, we will be discussing pilot season prep. If you're not already following the HALP Network on Instagram, it is at the HALP Network. And if you're not already following the Black Agents Network on Instagram, it, we are at Black Agents Network. This is an educational webinar being hosted by a collaborative executive artist community in an effort to aid you in your personal journey while pursuing a career in entertainment. The following presentation is a collection of opinions based on my personal experiences working in this business and is for informational purposes only. Attendees are encouraged to do their own due diligence and absolve all parties from liability by attending this webinar. All rights are reserved. About the Jackson Agency. The Jackson Agency is a diversity and inclusion driven talent and literary agency with over 200 clients worldwide. We amplify the voices of the underrepresented, the underserved, and the underestimated. Our current affiliations are ATA, DGA, WGA, and SAG AFTRA. About me, I've been in the news. I've been in the New York Times, the Arizona Informant, TMZ, The Hollywood Reporter, Deadline, Citizen, etc. More about me, I went to an HBCU, Jackson State University. I am a graduate of Chapman University in Orange, California, and also a two-time graduate of UCLA. I'm also a certified tax preparer. I'm the first known black woman with WGA signatories in California and Georgia. I'm the first and only signatory in Atlanta, Georgia. I was the only boutique agency profiled by the New York Times. I'm the first black agent to speak at the Actor Studio Drama School and the first agency to not need a diversity and inclusion executive to coordinate diversity initiatives. I also serve as the co-chair of the ATA's Racial Equality Task Force, and I'm a founding member of the Black Agents Network. Today, we're gonna discuss four things, pilot season, presentation for branding, and striking whether or not your brand is actually accurate, and then we're gonna follow it up with a Q&A. Pilot season, what is it? In a nutshell, pilot season is the official period of time where studios, production companies, and networks begin to cast the projects they want to place into contention for the upcoming television season. Around December, casting directors are provided with the pilots they have been assigned to cast for the upcoming season. Once these pilots are broken down, they are disseminated to target agencies where lists are prepared of A-list talent that is interested in either being hired, offered only, or auditioning. From there, the breakdowns will be released to the rest of the agencies. Yes, I saw my typo. All right, here's the deal. There are probably about a million of you that are chasing this dream. Actors Access at one point in time reported that they had over half a million active profiles, which means there are a lot of you competing for one role. On average, casting receives somewhere between 3,000 to 5,000 roles in a breakdown. Competition is stiff. So what we're gonna to discuss today are a few key things that you can do to fix your profiles so you stand a better chance of going out. Here's what you need to understand. Pilot season really just focuses on series regular, recurring, and co-stars. There will be supporting roles inside of pilots. It's not all just stars of the show. Sometimes you need drunk girl at a party, neighbor, secretary, things of that nature. So it is possible for you to book a pilot but not be on the cast of the show to just be in there as a co-star. So what's a series regular? Series regulars are the star of the show. They're the names that you know and love. They are the faces that drive the narrative and the plot of the story. Recurring. 
These are people who show up somewhat often. Think boyfriend, girlfriend, next door neighbor, mom, dad, something along those lines. For co-star, they are purely there to advance the plot. They can have anywhere between zero to 10 lines. Now the pay varies not only based on the type of the project, but the union status and the tier. You have to understand that. There are a lot of different tiers that the union has that dictates what the rate of pay is going to be. On average for a major network show, co-stars are around $1,100 now as a point of reference. Guest stars are about three to 5,000. Series regular starts around 30 to 35,000 per episode. So where are the pilots? Mostly they're on Actors Access. You may find some on casting networks, but mainly Actors Access is where all of what we call theatrical is, and that's film and television, not theater. You might see things on Mandy or IMDb or Backstage, but on the agent side, we use three main sites, Casting Frontier, Casting Networks, and Actors Access. So that's why I'm gonna be discussing Actors Access. All right, so here's how it typically works during pilot season. A breakdown is released. From there, a profile is submitted. So whether your agent or your manager is submitting you or maybe you're self-submitting, you're getting pertinent information to see whether or not this role matches your age range, matches your ethnicity, and in some instances, matches your union status. Then you're submitted. From there, casting receives those submissions and they go through and they start doing what's called selects. And selects are where they can number people and categorize them and kind of set them off to the side from the general pool of submissions so that they can review them again in a little bit more detail. And from there, then they'll start sending out auditions. Right now, because of COVID, all the auditions are gonna be Ecocast, which are self-tapes or possibly Ecocast Lives. So you're gonna have to just go ahead and be okay with self-taping. You're not gonna really be able to go into the office in person anymore. And that does make it much more difficult, I'll be honest. You don't have the redirects that you normally would get by not being in the casting director's room. So my advice to you would be to get a coach and make sure you're working with someone so that you're turning in the best possible takes so that you have a chance of getting what is called a callback. So after the auditions are sent out, they'll review the auditions. They may select maybe 10 or 20 people from those and do what are called callbacks. And it's a second audition. And from there, they may whittle it down to what is called a test deal. So you could potentially go in for essentially a third audition and do a lot of different things. It can be a chemistry reading with a lead that they already have offered, um, a role to, and now they're trying to see whether or not you two get along, what's your chemistry like, do you guys look good together on screen? There's a lot of nuances that go into network tests. It's, it's very nerve wracking, I would imagine, for you guys because you're so close to the finish line. But a lot of it is figuring out, you know, do audiences like you? You can book a pilot and still not be hired. You have to understand that. You can book a pilot shoot the pilot, and then the pilot can go to a focus group. And if that focus group says, oh, I like everybody but you, they will recast you. And that happened, um, it's happened quite a bit. One point of reference I can give you is Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Allison Hannigan was not the original Willow for Buffy. So what they do now is, I think studios really have learned their lesson. Meaning a test deal goes in place before you're actually hired for the show because they don't want to have a fight with you as a talent and the agent trying to get more money out of them. So they go ahead and lock you into a certain rate of pay now, let you come in and do your network test. And then they know that if they do wanna hire you, you've already agreed to these terms. So it's really, it's really about just circumventing any problems and having prolonged negotiations. All right, let's talk a little bit about your branding and type, but just so you know that next month, Ezra Jones of the F State, who's the other co-founding member of the Black Asians Network, he's gonna do a webinar for you guys specifically about branding. Today, I'm just gonna give you a brief overview to get you to start thinking about certain things, but I highly recommend that you sign up for the next webinar where that entire hour will be dedicated to branding, why it matters, what to do. Okay, here is the easiest way if you're brand new to figure out your branding. One, take a picture. Take any headshot that you have, whatever your go-to headshot is, 
and post it on social media. You can post it on Twitter, Facebook. There are some groups on Facebook where you can post headshots and get feedback from people. You can even send it to your family, send it to professors, just send it to people and start asking them what they see. Where this is coming from is, is a lot of you guys feel like you are, you want to be seen a certain way. I can use an example of, I had a client who wanted to be seen as like the next Angelina Jolie action hero, but all of her pictures that she used on her profiles did not paint that picture. And so what happens is, is you see yourself a certain way, but the rest of the world sees you in an entirely different way. So let's take the guesswork out of that and start asking the world how they see you, okay? Once you post on social media, what I recommend doing is giving them a list of succinct, finite words, meaning guy next door, girl next door, cop, doctor, friendly, gay best friend, et cetera. Make them pull from that list to give to you because this next step is gonna be you putting it into a word cloud. So what's a word cloud? A word cloud is where you take a list of words, you throw them into a software and it aggregates the words and starts to embolden the words that pop up the most commonly. So if you're seeing guy next door or girl next door a lot, then you're probably that more so than next Angelina Jolie action hero. From there, you can start searching the casting sites for roles in your age range and in that branding type, and then start submitting yourselves and seeing whether or not you're getting auditions. Once you go on your auditions, see whether or not you're getting callbacks. If you're not getting callbacks, then you're gonna need to definitely stop what you're doing, go get with a coach, and start figuring out what you're doing wrong when you're in the room. At this point, there is no feedback. The feedback is you didn't get the callback. So if you didn't get the callback, something was up. Because a lot of times when you do a good audition, casting will contact you or contact your agent to say, you know what, they did really great. We just had to go in a different direction because they wanted um, a girl that was a little bit taller, right? Or they wanted a brunette. There, there are so many things that happen that when you don't get the part, it doesn't always mean that you weren't the best, you know, you weren't good at it. Sometimes it just means, oh, we actually already have another girl on the cast that has the same look as her. So we have to have a different girl. If you ever watched One Tree Hill behind the scenes, they'll talk about that, where Bethany Joy Lenz um, has like naturally somewhat cur curly hair, but Hillary always had curly hair on the show. So one day she was trying not to straighten her hair and wear it straight, um, wear it curly. And they came back and said, no, you're gonna have to straighten your hair because Hillary's hair is already curly. We can't have any confusion. This is coming from the network. So understand there's a lot of politics that go into chasing this dream. All right. Now, if you're an advanced actor, if you're not new to the game and you understand what's going on and maybe you have representation, here is my advice to you. Ask for your submission report. Agents are not obligated to give it to you, but if you can get one, to me, they are a gold mine of information. When you've hit a wall and you're not going out, it's time to assess what is out there for you and what you are being perceived as. Start with the social media posts, create your target list, look through your hard drive for unused headshots that are a better match, or just change up your look altogether. Figure out which well-known actors you are similar to. And remember, you are the CEO of your brand and your company. And so the responsibility falls solely upon you. All right, now that you've done all this work, the question is, is, is your branding even accurate? Here are my pilot season prep questions. One, is your brand accurate? Do your headshots and clips match the branding that you've come up with for yourself? So if you are guy next door, then we should see clips of you interacting with a significant other. We should see clips of you just being a good neighbor, just being that all around nice guy, nice gal. That's what we wanna see on your profiles. If you've got stuff that's all over the place, then you may need to take the time to really focus on one thing, on one brand, and then work on getting auditions, getting bookings and that before you keep expanding into other things, all right? Step two, assemble a target list. Which shows are you a fit for realistically? Now, this is the one that gets everyone. When someone comes in and I ask them, you know, what's your brand, what's your type? I don't know, okay, what kind of shows could you see yourself on? It's always the Emmy Award winning Golden Globe shows, right? I, I see myself on Succession. I see myself on This Is Us. I see myself on this, that, and the other. You need to realistically look at which shows you are a fit for, okay? Yes, you want to be on TV and you want to be on anything that you can possibly get on, but truthfully, are you really right for this? 
sometimes if you look at shows, they have a very specific brand. I'm going to use the TV show SWAT as an example. If you've ever watched SWAT, it's a CBS show. Shamar Moore leads that show. If you notice, all the men on that show are very skinny, very petite, always showing their biceps, always showing skin. The women are on, on that show are very skinny, very petite. It's very LA-ish. They have a certain look and brand for that show. And so when you're submitting on that type of show, your agent, if they're familiar with the show or your manager is going to submit people that are similar to what they're already seeing on that show. You have to understand that shows are their own brand as well. And that's what they decided to do with that show. So just because you're a fan of that show doesn't mean you're going to be able to be on that show. You may not look the way they need you to look for that show. So that matters. So if you've ever heard the term, you know, what's your look? That's what they're talking about. After you figured out your target list of shows, next you're going to figure out who the casting directors are for those shows. You can use IMDb, you can use Instagram, you can use Twitter, you can use Facebook. There are a lot of tools you can use. Um, Breakdown Services has a casting about. If you want to go in there, you can look up all the stuff. It's a subscription based thing. I don't remember how much it is. It's probably 15 bucks or so for you guys per agents at several hundred dollars for the year. So we, we get charged more than you guys do to have access to the breakdowns and the supplemental toys and tools that we use to do our jobs. So what you're going to want to do is figure out who that casting director is, maybe look at their resume and their catalog of other shows. You may find a common theme. Okay. There are some casting directors who only cast children's shows. There may be other casting directors who only cast sitcoms and comedies. So some casting directors have niches. They're not all just casting anything and everything. Some cross over into feature films as well as doing TV or hardcore drama. So you really have to start doing your research about who is responsible for providing the talent for this show. That stuff really matters, especially when you're trying to reach out to the casting director to see if they'll read you. Okay, and what I mean by that is see if they'll give you an audition. Step four, additional research. I would recommend looking for the showrunner, looking for the directors, the writers, producers, anybody who's associated with that show and troll on social media, okay? You're gonna follow these guys, start looking at their body of work, really seeing where you fit in in all of it. And if you're really good at it, maybe build a relationship so that perhaps you can get on the show through untraditional means, which is networking. Step five, your name, your credits, and why you are right for this. That is all that needs to be in a pitch email. So if you are emboldened enough to say, you know what, Tiana, I'm the perfect fit for this show. I want to pitch myself to casting. What do I say? You state your name, your credits, and why you are right for this. And then you should probably link to your demo reel and hope for the best. That's it. But I do not recommend doing this if you are not the absolute 100% perfect fit for this show. Casting directors, just like agents, are getting bombarded all day. They're busy. We're bothering casting directors. It's not really a good look if you're bothering casting directors, but if it's something that's very specific that you know you're a match for, then you're good to go. And I'll give you some examples because you're going to be like, what are you talking about? Military-based shows. For those of you that are fellow veterans, when you, you know you have weapons training, right? You know you have the discipline. You know you have the cadence. You know you have the look. That's when it's appropriate to reach out to a casting director, maybe of, of SWAT or SEAL team or whatever military themed show and say, hey, you know, I am a veteran. I was an OEF and um, I, I can do this, this and this. You know, would you be interested in reading me for an episode? And that casting director may be like, oh, yes, your timing is perfect. I can't tell you how many times my clients have done their due diligence and did their quarterly marketing and their email landed in a casting director's inbox at the perfect time to where we received private auditions for the show, roles that didn't even make the breakdown. So let me go ahead and mention that now. There are roles that are cast that will never make it to the casting sites. Casting directors can go directly to agencies or they can go directly to the actors and pull you in, okay? So not everything is on the casting sites. So this really is about a hustle, but enough about that. Okay. Now I'm going to show you guys an example of what a good resume looks like. All right. This is one of my clients, Lucy Boyer. She's been a series regular. 
If you're old like me, you'll remember her from Doogie Howser. She played Janine. She's had guest star credits. She's a Cal Arts graduate, and she's been able to have a career this entire time. Oops, magic mouse failing me. Hold on, don't go back. Okay, so this is Lucy's uh, profile. This is what your profiles look like when you're attached to an agent. So if you're looking for, you know, why yours doesn't look like this is, this is what it looks like for every person who's attached to my agency. So any agent has their own actual private link to a talent's profile that we can send out. And so this is it, and this is what it looks like. So with Lucy's resume, I wanna show you, look how nice and neat and clean it is. A lot of you guys are making a mistake when it comes to your resumes and you have to stop. You're really gonna to have to take the time. It takes probably about 10 minutes to put your resume together, type it out nice and neat and clean. So on column one, if you notice, we did the name of the show. So all you're seeing in the first column are all the different shows that she's been on, okay? Column two is that billing that we talked about, series regular, guest star, co-star. So for television, it's gonna be series regular, recurring, guest star, co-star, U5. That's normally what you're gonna see. It's not gonna be character names and it's not gonna be featured. Featured is background. I don't recommend putting that on your resume at all, but that's up to you on what you wanna do. In the third column, we put either the network, the studio, or the production company. So with Doogie Hauser, this was a Stephen Boschko production. So we put that there, that name has value. With Liza On Demand, Lucy was a guest star there yelling at Liza on the sidewalk. And so that was a YouTube series with Liza Koshi at the helm. Tosh.0, she played a really cool character in a bathtub for a skit with Comedy Central. So you get the picture. Now, what's also important to notate here is that for the television section, I went ahead and grouped these by like terms. So if you notice, it flows perfectly. Your resume is the picture of you. So we started with her, her biggest credit, which is series regular. Then we lumped together all the guest stars and then we went into the co-stars. So I highly recommend doing this because it just looks better when you're giving your resume to a stranger essentially or a casting director or a producer or some director or whatever guy you met on the street and you're painting a picture of, oh, wow, they've been in this. Oh, wow, they've been in this. And then, and then okay, they've had you know, some smaller roles over here doing these things. It just flows better. Now for films, the only reason why these two are out of order is because they were bigger films. Lucy's currently in a film called Hard Luck Love Song with Sophia Bush and I think Michael Dorman is his name. So that one, of course, is gonna go up to the top. It's already premiered at Austin Film Festival. The other one is a Hallmark movie that she did. So that's recent. So we moved that to the top and then we went back to the lead, the supporting. So that's the only reason why those two are out of order. They have a little bit more weight to them. For commercials, oftentimes you'll see conflicts available upon request or in our case, we did available upon request as her resume was already getting kind of long to begin with. But you can list your commercials here and you do the same thing that you did for film and TV. The name of the commercial, a lot of times here you'll put principal, lead, okay? And then you can do the director or the production company or maybe even the brand if you remember exactly what it is, all right? Now for the training section, improv, comedy, Meisner. Those are kind of the three main things that we wanna see. Notice that for her bachelor's of fine arts, we kept it very simple. We did BFA of acting. We did not go and list every class that she had while she was at CalArts. That's a mistake that you guys make that I don't recommend that you do. You're going to need to continue to do training outside of university, okay? So don't sit up here and put movement for actors one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, none of that, okay? Just BFA, whatever school you went to, MFA, whatever school you went to. Down below is gonna be the bio. You notice I have four sentences that are very succinct. It tells you where you know her from, what other places you may have seen her, where she went to school and what she enjoys. And she enjoys playing quirky and offbeat characters for comedy and hardened and flawed characters dramatically. If I had to say this is the perfect bio, this is the perfect bio. It tells you everything you need to know without going on and on and on. You notice we don't talk about how when she was a little girl, all she ever wanted to do was act. We got straight to the point of where have we seen her? What more has she done? How do we receive her? Okay, and then down below, 
you have your size cards, make sure you keep your size cards up to date. And then down here would be all your special skills. Okay, another example I'm gonna show you guys is one of my resident comedians, Jen Brown. But first we're gonna talk about these headshot types. TV shows typically have cop, soldier, nurse, attorney, office worker, street types. That stuff didn't change. So if you paid attention to the trends during um, the murder of George Floyd and all the protesting, all these cop shows got put on hiatus and you notice they're all back. Okay, that was just a temporary thing that they did as public relations crisis management to make you all think that they care. That's the best way I can say it, all right? So here are the types of shots that you will want to have. You're gonna wanna have a three quarter body shot. If you are 25 and up, you're gonna need a young mom, young dad. It does not matter that you do not have children. Do not fight me on this. I submit people for commercials every day. When you're 25, congratulations, you're a mom or a dad. Blue collar, this one is the most overlooked type that you guys should be doing, okay? You're gonna wanna look like a regular person. We see roles all the time for customer service, secretary, barista, all of those things are considered blue collar, the, the working class. Now, there are gonna be roles that'll be calling for a social light, so you're gonna need upscale business ballroom attire. And then for fitness, sometimes you'll wanna have those shots as well, especially if you have commercial representation or you don't, so you can submit for the more um, athletic-based brands. But even on some of these TV shows, you can go out and be you know, a co-star in a yoga studio doing some things. And then if you're a model, high fashion, lifestyle, fitness, nightlife, and catalog, and I'll leave it at that because modeling is Ezra's specialty, not mine. So let's take a look at Jen Brown's profile. So this is Jen Brown. And um, if we go back, you'll see we have um, a nice contrast of photos here. So if you are someone who has blonde hair, I highly recommend you get a wig. If you are someone who is over the age of 50, unfortunately, you are now considered to be a senior citizen. Okay, so just go with it. Go get a wig like this, so that way you have options. The name of the game, folks, is submitting a headshot that best matches the character description. And so, although Jen doesn't run around blah, uh, I should say gray, what we did do was have her get a wig that was gray. All right. So, Jen Brown's resume obviously is not as long as Lucy's, but she still has been in some shows. Just Shoot Me, Veronica Mars, Shark, okay? So if you notice, we still have everything in caps. For film, we have lead or supporting. She was in Lincoln Lawyer. For television, we have co-star, and then we have one stand-in role in here because sometimes we do see, see stuff like that for the agency level. We'll also see body doubles. We'll also see calls for stunts as well. So if you are a stunt person who's been hired to do stunts before, you can do that. One of my clients was um, a stunt performer on Stranger Things, okay? Commercials, the conflicts available upon request, and a conflict, we don't see them as much as we used to, but a conflict, in layman's, which is even more complicated, this is like, if you work a Toyota commercial, you cannot work a Nissan commercial, but it is not even that. It's even more complicated. I won't get into it, but typically that's what a conflict would be, okay? Theater is always gonna be the last thing before training. So if you're equity, you're gonna have two sets of hard copy resumes. One is gonna be for theater where you have all your theater stuff first. And then for your crossover into on camera, you're gonna have one that's gonna be film TV commercials first, okay? The last thing will always be training, okay? And then down here are a few of her special skills. So that's what it looks like. Now I'm gonna show you media, simple things that you can do. So for instance, there's a headshot that I really love that I use all the time with Jen for a detective. This is the shot right here and it actually works pretty well for submissions. She went and had a scene shot that's very simple. How's your day going? Fine, real good, thank you. It's a good answer. Don't answer me this. How come I got stuck with you? <laughs> Let me put this plainly. I don't like rookies. Rookies make mistakes. I haven't made any yet. You're new. That's a mistake. And you talk too much. That's a mistake. And that's the first thing you can learn. When you're talking, you're not thinking. Only talk when you have to. 
I run a special detail here. Best arrest record in the city. And that means we don't make mistakes. Remember that. And now remember this. I'm not here to teach you. You're here to learn. Nod your head if you understand. Okay, Jen Brown, ladies and gentlemen. So this is how you do a clip. From here, we got the hardened detective who takes no prisoners, tells it like it is, yada, yada, yada. Okay, and so that's what you're gonna have to figure out for your brand and your type. All right, now I'm gonna show you a sample breakdown. Okay, whoops, just kidding. There we go. And I'm logged out, of course. All right, I'm not supposed to show these, so don't do a retransmit of this. But this is basically what they look like. They ask for the characters, they describe male or female, they will describe ethnicity, but they'll give you a disclaimer that says they're committed to diverse and inclusive casting, but they will be specific with ethnicity in a, in a lot of these and tell us what we're, what we're supposed to submit. So just understand that this is why we have to get your age ranges right. This is why we have to get those ethnicities right. So with ethnicities, we're not talking about you know, what your 23 and me is, right? We're all a little bit of everything. I'm, I'm Blackfoot. One of my great grandmothers is Caucasian and Black. That is what's in my family. But when I set up my casting profile, I'm going to be checking off Black or African-American, okay? So this is not about trying to erase your heritage or anything. It's about what you present like when people look at you. So make sure you're not going overboard with your ethnicities because some of you guys will check off everything under the sun, but then you simply look Hispanic or you simply look Caucasian, okay? All right, that is enough babbling for me. Thank you very much. You can find me at thejacksonagency.com, TJ Agency on Twitter, Jackson Agency on Instagram, or The Jackson Agency on Facebook. We will now open it up to the Q&A. Okay. So the first question we have here is by Chanel and she asks, is it possible to get representation during this time? And if so, how? Yes, it is possible to get representation during this time. Normally pilot season would start um, first thing February for you guys, meaning auditions would come out. Breakdowns would come out in January. We submit and work on them. Casting would do their thing, getting everything together. Then they'd start seeing you. But because of COVID, it started literally January 4th when we came back off of um, New Year's break. And so there are still going to be agencies that are still doing a massive aggregation of talent. So normally pilot season would be that one time where everybody could get an agent, but they would get an agent on what is called a hip pocket or a verbal contract, meaning they're not going to contractually sign you, but they'll say, hey, I'll associate with you. If something comes up that is um, a dead on match for you, I might submit you. And so that's a hip pocket, okay? There are a lot of agencies that are verbal. They don't do contracts in any way, shape or form. So there's a possibility you could find an agency that will take you on for pilot season only, okay? And if you don't end up getting a pilot, they will go ahead and release you. How do you get an agent? Well, if you take some of the things that I just taught you about branding, put yourself together as a, ni a nice neat package, you can start finding those target agencies, just like we talked about finding target casting directors, you can find those target agencies and you can submit your materials in hopes that they'll be interested in working with you. Okay, anonymous attendee, fascinating. If you don't have a demo reel, what should we include instead? Well, my question is, is how can anyone get familiar with your work if you don't have a demo reel? So my advice to you would be to get a demo reel. 
anonymous attendee again how many different headshots should a 25 and younger actor have so for my agency i recommend four to six different shots and that list that i showed you is the list that i actually give to them okay with lucy you saw that she had a lot of shots up there we have shots that cover a lot of things that come up for her as a guest star but then you saw with Jen, we had about four succinct headshots that covered a variety of characters just with those four shots. Brittany. Hi, Tiana. For actors that don't have specific clips, would you say it's okay to do self-tapes instead? For example, I have a detective headshot and don't have a clip. Would it be good to do a self-tape? So the answer is yes and no. Yes, if that self-tape is absolutely amazing. But I think that sometimes it's better for you guys to have a professional scene shot than it is to do a self-tape because everybody's self-tape setup is different. Your self-tape setup could be like mine where there's a singular light over me. You might have a ring light. Some of you have backdrops. Some of you um, have really hazy camera lenses. Self-tapes, if you don't have halfway decent equipment, will be of poor quality. And what I don't want is for someone to disqualify you because your tape doesn't look like a normal professional tape. And so that's why a lot of times we tell you guys, go ahead and get your clips together from actual scenes, okay? Okay, Cynthia. What were the casting platforms you mentioned at the beginning? So the three main sites that we use on the agent side are Casting Networks, which is also LA Casting if you're Los Angeles based, Casting Frontier and Actors Access. There are tons more places that you can go to. There's Mandy, there's IMDB, there's 800 Casting, there's Talent Soup, there's um, some like Casting Calls Phoenix, there's, there's all kinds of stuff, Casting Calls Las Vegas. There's so many sites, but for us, we have an agency interface, which means when I sign a client, I can give them a code that allows them to attach their profile to my agency's roster. From there, I can submit their profile on their behalf with never ever needing their personal login details. And so that's the difference. A lot of these other sites don't have that capability. They're really designed for you specifically to go and do your self submits. Darrell Lyons asks, are you willing to represent actors in different markets than where you are based? Um, for me personally, yes. So the Jackson Agency is actually in about six different markets, Los Angeles, the Southwest, the Southeast, New York, Chicago, the United Kingdom, and Europe. So I actually have a local hire roster in every major region. And so I tell my clients, the more you can travel on your own dime, the more opportunities we can get for you. So I've been able to get my clients who live in New York jobs in LA. I've been able to get my clients in LA, jobs in Georgia, et cetera. So as long as you can travel and work as a local hire for the tax credits, we can work with you. Along with meeting our bare minimum requirements. So let me backtrack that before you're like, you told me I could submit. <laughs> Do you have your materials in order? Okay. All right. Loza Brooke. For black women and those who change their hair often, do you recommend having multiple headshots ready or is it okay to simply leave a note in your submission? So again, going back to the wigs thing, yes, for my African American talent, black talent of African diaspora, we often talk about, you know, braids, wigs, weaves, natural hair, etc. So my advice to you would to be uh, have the ability to sh have someone shoot you quickly and affordably for when you change up your look. So like in summer, it is common for us to get braids, right? And so you do need to have a headshot that matches that look if we're sending you out for the summer. Yes, you could go out with an old headshot. That can happen. But most of the time casting says they would prefer for you to look like your headshot. Your headshot is what caught their attention and that's why they're calling you in. So it's really about when you're doing drastic, drastic changes, it's time to update your headshots. So yes, I absolutely recommend having different headshots of the various looks that you may have throughout the year. It'll just make it easier in the long run. Anonymous attendee. Why are you anonymous is my question. Are there any specific tips on getting roles on Actors Access without an agent? You can self-submit. You can self-submit on every site. 
So submit. How do you make a demo reel? Well, there are um, companies that can, you can hire and they will assist you with that. Okay, if you wanna cut it into something then you need to learn non-linear editing. And I can't go into that with you because that's a whole nother animal. Do you need to look exactly like the headshot you submit if you get a callback? For example, if I changed my hair recently, is that going to be an issue? Yes and no. So again, like I said before, they kind of want you to look like your headshot, but they, there are some that are lenient, you know, as long as you're still somewhat of the same um, weight, I would say, you know, if you put on weight, then you're a little bit bigger than you were before. But it's just easier, you guys, if you have a headshot that matches what you currently look like, okay? All right. Amani, I've been at this for about three years. I keep asking my agent if I'm doing anything wrong or need to do anything more. And they keep saying I'm doing fine and to keep doing what I'm doing. I've had a couple co-stars, but really hoping to book a recurring or lead soon. Any advice on staying resilient? Unfortunately, it does take time. Um, you know, you, I would love for it to be instantaneous. You would love for, for it to be instantaneous, but it does take time. I've had clients that have been with me 18 months and never received an audition and all of a sudden everything aligned and it was like, boom. But the most important thing that I can tell you is, is to stay ready so you don't have to get ready. And that's our motto here is that you should always be working monologues, always reading copy, writing, doing whatever you can to stay in shape so that when an opportunity does come, you're ready for it. So in this particular instance, this client who it took over 12 months to finally get an audition for her, she went out on a commercial for the first time, she got the call back and she booked, okay? Because she stayed ready. So just stay ready. Is it okay to submit to a SAG posting if you are non-union and match the type? Yes. But there are some offices that do only want to deal with SAG actors. And we, it, we, we go through it sometimes as well. And unfortunately, they don't put it in the breakdown. And then we get the ego cast and get excited. And then they say, oh, do not have them come if they're not SAG after us. So that does happen. But we have had non-union people book shows. Yes. In fact, I've gotten some people eligible to join the union by getting them co-stars on shows. I'm not sure how I came, came across this, but <laughs> it is not. It's Elena, so sorry for the confusion. Yeah, you're a whole nother person apparently, <laughs> Elena. I don't, I don't know either. Rosie, can the submission reports help with so, social media research? Um, yeah, if you look at a submissions report, if you have an agent and you get a submissions report, you can look at it and it gives you literally the name of the show, uh, the character, and I believe the casting director. So yes, you have everything you need to Google and do your thing. Malika Soroya, when you are starting off, is a demo reel with student films appropriate? It can be. So look, guys, the, the demo reel here isn't designed to be complicated. It's designed to show a body of work, okay? So if you have a series of clips from a student film, but they are solid, they are dynamite, they make us say, oh my gosh, who is this person? I want to meet them, then that's what you should be using. The mistake that has been made is that you guys will just take everything you've ever been in and just throw it all together and be like, oh, here, see, here's my demo reel. And it's just all over the place and it's not good. That's what we're trying to circumvent. And then you also make the mistake of showing off all the cinematography. If we're trying to assess you for acting, I don't care about panning left and right and up and down and whooshes and whirls and the music and all that. I just want to see you act. Jalissa Fulton, what should someone do if they do not yet have much film experience, nor do they have a reel? Would it be great to maybe get an agent first before going into submitting for roles for pilot season? Well, you know, an agent is like the NBA. So if you don't have a body of work, you don't know how this works, are you just gonna immediately ask to be put on the Los Angeles Lakers, even though you don't even know how to play? 
So don't go and get an agent until you know how to play. Luke Lewis, how long does it usually take for casting directors to decide who gets callbacks? It depends. So you have to start understanding production schedules. And so this is why I tell you guys, you really need to be a student of this craft. It's not enough to just study your acting. A lot of these questions that you have will be answered if you actually studied producing, studied cinematography, studied, studied editing, et cetera. So there's a production workflow. Sometimes casting has time to put out breakdowns, see people, take general meetings, you know, take their time with something. And then other times, the episode may already be in production and then a table read occurred where they decided oh wow we really need to add another co-star really quick to help flesh out this scene and drive this narrative forward and so then casting is scrambling putting down out a breakdown and trying to get somebody read get somebody approved by producers get somebody approved by network it, it it's a three-step process okay it's not as simple as the casting director booked me on this the casting director takes who they want who they're interested in who they think is good they show them to the director and the producer. They come back and say, all right, I like this person. Or they say, eh, pick whoever you want. So the casting director picks who they want. Then they come to us and they say, hey, we have this person. Are they available? That's where the term avail comes from. We confirm whether or not they're, they're available. And then we set and wait because casting then takes it and sends it to the executives and casting at the network to get final approval. So it's not as simple as boom, you're just on TV. It goes through several levels, okay? So it can take a few days. It can take several weeks. It, it just, it doesn't, there's no set time, rhyme, or reason. We've submitted on projects in April and they came back with an audition in October, okay? You have to understand that production sometimes gets shut down. The money doesn't come, so they have to delay. There's all kinds of things that are going on, which is why we tell you guys to stay on top of your calendars. Brent Davis, okay, once I have all my marketing material together and moving to grab a theatrical agent, will most agents prefer to have me available commercially as well? I have a commercial agent, but no theatrical reps. Well, it depends on the agency. You can't lump in most agents. There are some agencies that are commercial only. There are some agencies that are dance only. There are some agencies that are theatrical only. There are some agencies that are full service, but then they have separate departments. So they might take you as a green actor commercially and say, we'll take you for commercial, but we won't take you for theatrical. So it all depends. And so again, that's why you have to do your research and generate that target list of agents. Theatrical is not easy to get. It is actually the hardest thing to get representation for. The easiest thing to get representation for is commercials because it's really just about your face. If you don't have credits, how many professional scene shots should you have on your profile? Scene shots? I don't know what that means, Rachel. Does not compute. Jasmine Reed, when would you actually use your demo reel, if ever, anymore? It seems like it's better to get clips and use those for specific roles or your agent submits you to. Well, yes, they're, they're one and the same. It, it depends on the way you're applying it. So. What she's talking about is a demo reel. Normally your demo reel would be about two and a half, three and a half minutes. And yes, not everybody's gonna watch the entire two and a half, three minutes, but what you're gonna do is take them and cut them out into clips. You might have some comedy clips, you might have some drama clips. And from there, we can take a look at a clip that might match a particular um, character archetype and submit it, okay? So I would say, yes, the demo reel still is in use. I have personally sent them to studios and networks. If you are an actor and a director, should you get two different agents? I, it's up to you. Ava May, what's the average audition before you get booked? <laughs> you can audition 50 times and still never book. Be patient, Grasshopper, we've talked about this. Giovanna Mundy. Hello, thank you for this first season prep. This is not only a great reminder, but update for myself. My name is Giovanna Mundy. Are you looking for new clients? If so, can we email you with our resume and headshot to set up an interview? Also, thanks Brittany and Marcella for this invite. This is super helpful, okay. Um, yeah, we have a website, thejacksonagency.com where you guys can submit. Yep, we already answered that one. 
Okay. Veronica Barrera, how often should you update your headshots? Um, I recommend annually, but sometimes you can do such a great job and you really didn't age much or change much to where you can use them for maybe max of two years, okay? Um, kids, you're going to kind of need to shoot every three or four months, depending on what their age is. You know, they grow pretty fast. They change a bit. And then once they're kind of like five or six, then you'll shoot two times a year. Adults tend to be once a year. Chanel, is it best to start off with a talent manager than an agent? Perhaps it all depends. To me, it's best for you to manifest your own destiny and get something going for yourself and then add people to the team. Chris Gunther, if you're non-union and getting audition requests for SAG productions and you deliver the goods and make it to the end of casting, but you're competing against a SAG or SAG eligible actor, will casting automatically rule in the favor of the SAG actor because of their union status? And secondly, would you recommend that your non-union clients stay non-union as long as possible or should they start doing background work to become SAG eligible ASAP? Thank you very much. Oh, wow, okay. Policies and prep. Um, <laughs> this has nothing to do with it. Um, I can't answer for casting. If there is a scenario to where SAG maybe is not happy about the amount of Taft Hartleys that a production is doing, then yeah, they might say, well, let's just take someone who's SAG-E. So, you know, they might be a must join. They're going to have to join to book this. There's a thing, was it? I think it's station 12 is a term um, where SAG clears an actor. Um, so if you're SAG and you haven't paid your dues, you, you won't clear station 12. You have to pay your dues before you can book that show. So it all just depends. Um, I, I've never known this to be, but again, there are over 600 casting directors. No two are the same. Everybody has different ways of doing things. And then also it depends on production and what they want to do. There were certain shows that we submitted on that were clear that they only wanted SAG talent. They were not going to Taft Hartley anyone. Okay. All right. Secondly, would you recommend that your non-union clients stay non-union as long as possible? Look, there's more work when you're non-union than there is union. You're gonna lose two thirds of your jobs if you go union. Now that is entirely up to you. Then you're also adding on extra expenditures such as union dues and the $3,000 union initiation fee. So you have to look at your personal finances and figure out whether or not that works for you, okay? Okay, whew, that was a lot, hold on. Anonymous attendee, was Jen's footage a credit or a professional scene shot? That was actually something that she went and used a real uh, creation facility to do, but she manifested her destiny. She made sure it was done the way it needed to be done. And so that's something that I advise my clients about. Okay, Giovanna, since everything is a taped audition, is it too much to make an executive decision for an audition and add a second take for options or just stick to the script? I hope executive decision doesn't mean you're about to just improv the whole scene like jazz. Look, you guys should be married to script. There are little things here and there that you could possibly do, but for the most part, you need to be performing what they have written for you. I am a fan of multiple takes and I'll leave it at that. You're gonna to need to get with your manager, your agent to figure that out or get with your coach or your casting director who's teaching your classes and ask them what they like. Gus Klein, there seems to be a disconnect between the talent side and the producer side, the interface on some sites like LA Casting, for instance, if they upload sides, doesn't mean I can get the video to them instantly or easily. Do agents ever look for this feedback or does LA Casting have a better plan? Quite frankly, I get better work from backstage because the interface is easier. Complaint department, please hold. Julia K, how do we make up for not having enough experience to put on our resumes when applying for roles or just in general? And so this is why that demo reel is so important, you guys. If you don't have any credits, but you've like left it all on the floor, they'll call you in, okay? Good talent is good talent. Doesn't matter whether or not you booked anything. It matters when, like, if a producer is trying to raise money for a film and they're like, they're a no name, but, you know, that can happen. But good talent is good talent. 
You talked about professional scene shots instead of self tapes if you don't have credits. I don't talk about professional scene shots instead of self tapes. Too. Yes, you can you can go to one of those. Do that. Loza Brook, are LA projects holding off on hiring out of state right now due to COVID? Is it realistic to still submit from out of, out of state at this time? Um, you are correct. You, it is local hires only. You can't be dragging COVID across state lines right now. Megan Akins, if you've been submitted for a specific show multiple times and haven't been called in for an audition and they don't have workshops, what's the best way to network and get your face seen? Backdoor channels. Are you friends with a grip? Are you friends with someone in the writer's room? Are you friends with the assistant to a director? Use your network. Anonymous attendee. If you're SAG eligible, are you still able to submit to non-union work? Yeah, we talked about this. SAG eligible is still non-union. All it is is just saying that if you wanted to join SAG, you could. Chanel, do demo reels clips have to be separated based on genre? Uh, I would hope so. Why would you lump drama and comedy together and then you're submitting for a show that's comedy and then you're leading with drama? That doesn't make any sense. Claire, what's the difference between a manager and an agent and which should beginning actors focus on getting? Um, again, you should be focused on getting yourself working. The difference between a manager and agent, a manager is supposed to hold your hand, set goals with you and be there for you when you cry at night. And an agent is supposed to submit you and get you work. But in Los Angeles, manager and agent has become blurred and a manager is either a second or a third agent now because a lot of them have access to the breakdowns and can submit you for projects as well. Giovanna, to clarify not what I meant, sorry, using the exact script, just giving a different direction for that scene, never straying from the script, just the choices made. Is it crazy to just add another option? No. So that's what we're talking about with second and third takes. You should have something that based on your scene analysis says, okay, this is what I think this is. And then, okay, here's a take that's like me, raw, unfiltered. Yes, absolutely. Do it. Megan Akins, when is the best time to send follow-up emails to CDs you've met with in workshops or general meetings? Um, I would do it within 72 hours, especially if you know they're casting something. Why wait? <laughs> Brittany Chapman, the real Brittany Chapman here. I can't believe we have this scandal. Um, what are some mishaps you see from an actor that has a lot of theater credits and are looking to transition into film and television? Yeah, so here's the thing. You guys come from schools that are very um, theater focused, theater centric, right? So you're focused on the work, you're focused on stage presence and enunciating and, and all these things. And TV is this, this little box here. I can't do all this, my arms are cut off, right? So you have to, learn on camera techniques. You have to make that transition appropriately from stage to screen. And sometimes it's hard to do. And that's why we recommend you guys going to school outside of university. You need to go to improv school. You probably need to go to a scene study class. You need to go to an on-camera class. You need to go to a comedy class. Things are different for on-camera acting than they are for theater. What's the difference in the amount of breakdowns an actor will see with and without an agent on Actors Access? I have no idea because I am not on Actors Access. So I don't know what you guys see. I would imagine you don't see what I see. So there's a difference. Ava May, what is a big mistake that actors do in self tapes? Oh, there's lots of things. Um, making sure you're in focus, making sure you're properly lit, making sure the sound is good making sure you slate right without panicking. I've, I've watched so many self tapes where some of you guys act like you forgot your name. Um, it's really just about treating it just like an in-person audition. You come in the room, cool, calm and collective, you do the work and you get out. Don't overthink it. But make sure that you're compressing your tapes and labeling your tapes. That's what's important. And those are the biggest mistakes right there. If you don't label your tapes. Does the color of the black backdrop matter for self tapes? Um, yes and no. I'm not a fan of um, 
using like a green screen where you didn't actually throw throw like a, something on it. You just you're just showing it green. Um, it's especially awkward if you're a redhead. It just looks like Christmas to me, so I don't recommend it. So I would go with like a a gray. You know, if you go with black, you have to learn how to properly light because you're going to want to separate yourself from the subject. So, you know, a red can be okay. Just try not to do something too obnoxious. Okay, a plain white wall can be fine. Just make sure it's professional. When you say slate for a self tape, do we slate for every self tape? Yeah, I would. All you're going to do is say your name and your agency, Tiana Jackson, the Jackson Agency, and then go right into your performance. Giovanna, when you say labeling, do you mean a slide with your name before the slate? No, I mean labeling your self tape. So your camera records and it might be MOV 45, right? Well, you're gonna need to rename that file to say Giovanna Mundy underscore Helen underscore slate. Guys, this is pilot season prep. What's going on here? <laughs> you got any questions about pilot season? That, that's what we're doing today. As a Southeast actor, I've seen a number of projects shot in the Southeast, but the bigger roles are still cast out of LA. Yep, I told you guys that. You have cognitive dissonance about that. How can I, a Southeast market actor, get on the casting director's radar in LA, given that LA casting is not seeing actors outside of LA right now? You're going to have to relocate. Ava May, do you think there's a certain hairstyle that casting directors prefer on black women? Yes, as the changing of the tides go, apparently so does the black woman's hair, right? Back in my day, you had to have straight hair. If you had hair, the, like the hair I have now, you were radical and they didn't want to have you. Now, if you have hair like I have now, oh my gosh, you're so cute, I want to see you. So yes, it does. Some shows, though, want like that straight conservative hair. Um, Greenleaf, I think the Netflix show, if you notice, there, there's not too many natural hair people on there. So that's why you got to study the show, guys. Do you slate in character? It depends. It really depends. You could, or you could just be a regular person and say your name, have some personality, maybe smile a little bit too. How can I see the pilot castings without an agent? I don't know. If casting releases them to your side, then perhaps you could probably see them. Sometimes they'll do that, but you're gonna to have to be signed up on the casting sites. For actors that book series, regular roles for big network shows, do they have to relocate using their own money? Um, yes and no, it depends on whether or not your agent is astute enough to make them pay for that. What are your favorite qualities to see in your talent during pilot season? Um, for progression, working, working as hard as I am. Uh, we, we had a conversation about this last night internally. Okay. Chelsea Miller, Tiana, you are the bomb. Thanks, Chelsea. I plan to submit to your agency soon, but I know my demo reel needs more work. Uh-oh, somebody did something. Come on now, stop putting questions in there. I was almost done. Do you suggest waiting until my demo reel is perfect or should I plan to submit anyway while I continue perfecting it? I would submit when your stuff is absolutely perfect and know that I do same day last minute um, interviews because it simulates what an audition will be like. So if I have 200 and something people who have submitted, I will make 20 something slots for the day and you guys are either gonna make it or you're not. That's, that's what it boils down to. Brittany Chapman, the real one. Can you tell us more about the pilot auditioning process and what that looked like for an actor pre-pandemic from the moment they get an audition to the time they book the role? I talked about it in the slides. We submit, you get an audition. If you did really, really well, you get a call back. If you did even more awesome, you'll get a network test deal. Boom. The only difference now is, is everything, there's going to be more tapes than in-person auditions. And then EcoCast, they made this EcoCast live thing so that way you don't have to be in a Zoom room to do your auditions. I would imagine a network test, they're going to do that in person and do a COVID test and do all that stuff anyway, because you get, you get paid for that. Yeah. Giovanna Mundy, since the digital era has changed the way the industry releases series and films, are there now multiple times of year that mirror the pilot season of 10 years ago? Isn't pilot season more of an all year thing or is it really around February to April-ish? So there are some shows, off network shows, like for instance, Insecure on HBO. 
they would typically shoot from, I think, August through December. So we would see those breakdowns come out during that time. Traditionally, yes, pilot season is right now, like we're telling you, but yes, there are series that are there, there are series that are greenlit and ordered to series all the time. So we may see pilots sporadically throughout the year, but this time of year is where we see the most. I did it. I got them all. Okay. Thank you for attending pilot season prep. Jackson out. We did it, Joe. We did it.